Senator St Steve Stadelman is an award-winning TV news anchor and father of four who ran for a seat in the Illinois Senate in 2012 because of his experiences as a journalist and as a parent convinced him of the need for fresh, common sense representation in Springfield. His public policy achievements have twice since earned him recognition as Legislator of the Year, and he has brought home tens of millions of dollars in state funding for projects that expand the local economy and improve our quality of life here. Senator Stadelman secured $275 million towards development of passenger rail between Chicago and Rockford and co-sponsored legislation to allow a Rockford casino, who's in the room, thank you, uh, legislation that ensures Loves Park and McChesney Park share in the tax revenues. As you can see, I think they actually merged their tables together over there. So it's working, it's working, Senator. We have consistently delivered state, uh, he has consistently delivered state funding for the Chicago O'Hare International Airport and the Rockford Park District facilities, including Sand Park Pool right here in Loves Park and Sports Corps as well in Loves Park. So thank you for that. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Senator Steve Stoddard. have to figure out how to use this first, right? Well, hello everybody. Uh, it is amazing that even though it's been 10 years now since I've worked for Channel 17, time goes really fast. I'm getting really old quickly. But even though it's been that length of time, there are people that still think I work for Channel 17. <laughs> Just a couple weeks ago, someone came up to me going, you're the news guy. I'm going, no, nah, I'm not the news guy, at least not anymore. He goes, no, you're the news guy. And um, he goes, I saw you on Channel 17 the other night. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm often interviewed by media as a state senator, so maybe he just doesn't get the roles correct as far as what he's seeing on TV. And um, he goes, no, no, you're the news guy. And so at that point, I figured, you know what? I'm going to give it up. I think I'd rather be known as a news guy than a politician these days. End of conversation. Tanya, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you're doing an incredible job. Um, the outreach from you and the Parks Chamber has been amazing uh, since you've been here. Uh, and you're never uh, scared to show you your, your mind and your policies regarding uh, Chamber and business activities. And that's much appreciated. So we want to know what the Chamber's thinking. So you're never shy about that. So thank you for making sure we're up to date on, on issues and, and legislation. So. Um, and thanks again for this opportunity. Uh, this is a great idea to have this legislative forum. Uh, you know, it's a chance to get different viewpoints about state legislation, different ideas. Uh, it encourages good dialogue, and that's what democracy is all about. We all want the same things. We want good education. Uh, you want a strong economy. You may have some differences, opinions about how to get there, and some political games may, may be played. But at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. So dialogue's good. And uh, I think this really contributes to that. I understand I'm the uh, last of the legislative uh, presentation, so that's good and bad. Uh, the, the good thing or the bad thing is probably you may have heard a couple things I've had to say already if you've attended all the forums. Uh, another bad thing, you may disagree with what I have to say and may contradict what other people have said so far. But the good thing for me is I get the last word, at least when it comes to legislative issues. Uh, first of all, for all the local businesses who are here represented today, thank you very much. I know the past couple years have been extremely difficult with the pandemic. Face it, running, operating a business is hard to begin with, especially smaller businesses. And the fact that you've been trying to survive and deal with uh, the curveballs thrown your way, thank you very much. Appreciate your efforts. So if you follow politics, you know these are kind of crazy times politically. Uh, you know, people seem very, very polarized. Uh, they're you know, I was at the Boone County Fair just this past week, and I'll be at the Winnebago County Fair uh, this week as well. And so you meet and talk to a lot of people, and that's why you're there. So it's interesting to get people's uh, different perspectives. And I really sense people have always been passionate about politics, but there's like a new and stronger intensity about your feelings and more willingness to kind of blame the other side and call the other side names or the other side doesn't know what they're talking about. It's just, I think it's just been kind of the sign of our times 
uh, the past couple of years. And I think part of the problem is, I think politics has become nationalized to some extent. They see what's going on in Washington or with the presidency, and uh, they watch cable news outlets, and everything kind of filters down to the local and state levels. And that's people's understanding of politics. They see what the national level. And that's somewhat unfortunate because um, I think people are too willing to put their opinions depending on the fact whether you have an R or D next to your name. And you know, no party has monopoly on good ideas. Politics at the end of the day is about compromise. And if you go through life and the political world thinking, okay, you're an R, or you're a D, I support you or don't support you, nothing gets done. And I, I think that unfortunately with the nationalization of politics, we're seeing that at the state and local level, level as well. And I just see that in the conversations. I don't know about you, but family conversations over the holidays are extremely difficult at times when it comes to national politics. And uh, I think it's just what we're dealing with. You know, despite the rhetoric you hear from a lot of politicians and the, uh, the political discourse, Believe it or not, in Springfield, uh, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle do really work together. Um, you know, I'd say 85 to 90 percent of the legislation, uh, you work together, you agree on it. It's bipartisan. A lot of legislation passed unanimously. People don't see that side of it. What they see is a 10 to 15 percent of legislation that is uh, controversial, the media reports on, and uh, becomes a political football. And so it creates the impression that uh, we don't know how to work together. I mean, I get frustrated as well, like everybody else, but I know in Springfield, most of the time, bills pass unanimously and there's an effort to uh, work together. And I think people need to make sure that they're aware of that. Um, no, there are, you don't disagree because sometimes there are policy differences. Sometimes uh, there are political games being played as well. I'll never forget when I first came to town as a reporter, uh, one of my first interviews was Zeke Georgie, the longtime state representative in the Rockford area, had a lot of success in Springfield. And he always called me Kid. He goes, Kid, the General Assembly is the greatest show on earth. Now I know exactly what it means now that I'm in the middle of it myself. Just fascinating perspective that I had over the years. You know, during those debates and the posturing that goes on as a reporter, I actually dealt with that from a journalistic standpoint. And so it's interesting to be in the middle of it right now. And journalists like to look at themselves as fact checkers, right? And you see whether it's CNN or Fox News and whatever media organization, um, they have fact-checking exercises. And I always want to do that on the center floor when I hear the debate going on. Um, but the problem is it seems like people don't necessarily agree what the facts are anymore. Who was a former White House uh, spokesman, Kellyanne Conway? She termed the, uh, she called them alternative facts. I don't know what that is, but somehow the idea is that you can have uh, disagreements or different interpretations of what a fact is. Um, I'm not here to analyze the media and politics, uh, but I think it's simple to say that when people don't agree on facts, it's easy for misinformation to be weaponized. And when you don't agree on facts, how do you come to a compromise? How do you pass policies when you don't can come up with the facts are? And I think that's kind of some of the problems we're dealing with right now. Misinformation has been weaponized and people forget where the facts are. And I think that causes problems when it comes to passing legislation. So I can bring water actually. So having said all that, let me venture into my view of the uh, state of the state. Since this is a, a chamber event, let's start with some what I believe are some pro-business policies that have been approved by the General Assembly the past couple of years. Again, in the past uh, couple of sessions, uh, we've had an expansion of manufacturer's purchase credit, the extension of research and development tax credit, uh, extension of EDGE tax credits. Now, the EDGE program is what allows the state to compete with other states when it comes to projects uh, that may be coming to a particular state or trying to make sure that they stay here. Um, every state has this program. As you know, it's complete, uh, a very competitive landscape out there. Businesses demand that when they're looking to move or stay, that you put an offer on the table. That's a fact of life. I know it's frustrating for current businesses uh, who may not be able to take advantage of the edge tax credits or uh, are already here. And they're saying, well, why is the state supporting other ventures that may become here? It's a fact of life. If we want to try to attract new industry, new manufacturers, new business, you have to put an offer on the table, and that's what the edge tax credits do. The business apprenticeship uh, tax credit. Apprenticeships are incredibly important. The state realizes that. 
uh, the uh, lower corporate franchise tax. Now, I was hoping to eliminate this uh, a couple years ago. It's kind of these fees that businesses have to pay in order just to do business. We've been able to lower that, but I'm still hoping that we're able to eliminate uh, the franchise tax altogether. Just this past spring, we passed something called the Homegrown Business Opportunity Act. And that basically requires DCL. And uh, Tanya just left, she's a representative of DCO. And so if there are business opportunities, grants, policies you wanna know about, ask um, Tiana when she, uh, when she comes back, uh, or recognize her when she, before, when she walked back down. But the, the Homegrown Business Act requires DCO to provide notices of funding opportunities to small businesses and municipalities all along the state border. So obviously we're pretty close to Wisconsin. I'm sure businesses are here from the state of Wisconsin all the time want to make sure that they think the grass is greener on the other side. So we want to make sure that there's Tiana right there. Um, I've never introduced somebody, no one's, no one's been at their table, so bad timing on my part. You know. But you know, she's the person you want to contact. But we want to make sure that DCO gets the word out to businesses along the state border, in this case Wisconsin, that you're aware of great opportunities and what the state can offer you to make sure you stay here. Again, just examples of what I think uh, that we passed legislatively to help businesses and make sure that we can complete, uh, compete on a national basis. All right, let me ask you a question. Don't be shy, raise your hand. This is the audience uh, participation part of the program. Uh, who agrees with uh, the following beliefs? Who thinks people are fleeing the state of Illinois? Who thinks the state's budget is out of control? Who thinks state spending and taxes are out of control? Or who thinks downstate Illinois doesn't get its fair share of tax revenue? Don't be shy, raise your hand. All right, there's a few skeptics out there. I get that, I appreciate that. Thanks for participating. Um, so let me give a shot at uh, maybe presenting uh, a different narrative or alternative facts, as uh, Ms. Conway would say. Listen, I'm not gonna stand here and say everything's wonderful, that we don't have challenges in the state, that we need to continue to work from a legislative perspective to make this a better place to live and work. I'm not saying that at all. I just think sometimes we need to tout the positive news more so. And sometimes I think that gets lost in the conversation. That's what I hope to change as far as the narrative that I just uh, presented. And again, different viewpoints are good. It's part of democracy. Uh, we all want the same thing, but um, I think too often, especially in this state, um, negativity can dominate. And uh, all that naysaying and information, unfortunately, is used to push a political agenda. And that's why I'm coming forth this day. I'd say when we discuss how to improve our economy, now the information out there is equal. You need to make sure that you, uh, what you're hearing is true. All right, here's a graphic. Don't worry, I'm not gonna test your, your mathematical abilities here. I know, Stileman, what are you doing to us? What, what kind of confusing <laughs> contraption is that? Uh, this graph shows the state's backlog of bills since 2017. Now, you may remember that year, we were in a horrific stalemate between the former governor and the state legislature. It went on for two years. Uh, the backlog of bills, you can't really see the number, but it was $17 billion was a backlog of bills. An incredible number. That was almost half of our operating budget. Uh, businesses, vendors weren't being paid on time. Some bills were going two years without being paid. No way to run a state. A, hor a horrific uh, situation. So, you can see where we are now, although you really can't see the numbers. The backlog of bills is now down to basically zero. Instead of not paying bills in two years, we're paying bills in a one to two week period, which is incredible. In, in five years, we've been able to, to, to reduce that uh, backlog of bills. As you probably heard, six credit upgradings, our rainy day fund now has a billion dollars uh, in case you know, the economy takes a downturn. Um, now I'm showing you this because you may have heard that information, but you can see the gradual nature of the reduction of the backlog of bills. There was a big drop initially when we finally uh, resolved the situation uh, between the government and the legislature. We had to borrow money just to pay off the backlog of bills. I and mean, we were paying like a billion dollars in interest payments. It was just, from a financial standpoint, not good. But you see a gradual reduction. And I point that out because some people are sitting out there, the only reason the state's paying its backlog of bills is because they got all this federal money. You got you know, 13, 14 billion dollars, and that's why the state of Illinois has been able to pay a backlog of bills. Not true, not one dollar of that federal money, and whether you agree with it or not, has been used by the state to pay its backlog of bills or balance its budget. It's been state revenue. So you see, it's not a, that final year, fiscal year at the end, there wasn't a huge drop off. 
It's been a continual process during that five-year period. That means conservative budgeting. That means, fortunately, good tax revenue, which is stronger than expected. The economy has been much stronger, especially the past couple years during COVID. Uh, the state budgeted conservatively because we didn't know what the, you know, the numbers were going to be when it comes to revenue. But the state revenue picture remained strong. People found a way to buy things just in a different way. They did it online. Uh, we were able to maintain our tax revenue. And you may not believe this, but keeping spending in line, I'll get more of that in a second. But again, that's been a gradual five-year process. It's not been all of a sudden the federal government bailed us out. I think that's an important point uh, to, to note. You know, the state's fiscal situation, a yearly annual, annual uh, budget situation, I think is the best in 20 to 25 years. I mentioned we, uh, we've balanced the budget every year. Um, we've also been able to take, because of... Uh, the additional funding, and you've heard about the $2 billion in tax relief. Again, that's not from federal money. That's one-time expenditures that we had an additional $5 billion in tax revenue. Instead of creating new programs, we decided to give some money back to taxpayers. Obviously, inflation is very difficult. More money in the pocket. Uh, all the tax measures are probably per family, six, seven, eight hundred dollars I heard one previous speaker say it's just a couple hundred dollars. Well, I know a lot of families, including mine, appreciate five, six, seven hundred dollars right now of additional income um, from the state. You know, if you're wondering where the federal money has been used, it's for the extra healthcare costs associated with COVID. Um, we help small businesses, several hundred million dollars, uh, half, nearly half a billion dollars to help small businesses keep their head above water during COVID. It's been a very difficult time. Uh, rental assistance, helping people stay in their homes. Um, we also gave $3 billion to the uh, State Unemployment Trust Fund, which has a deficit now because of the, the slow economy. You know, businesses have been having to rely on that. And I know Republicans wanted more, and you're probably going to hear a lot about that during the, you know, the campaign. Uh, but it's still $3 billion of almost a $5 billion deficit. Traditionally, this problem when you have a deficit has been you have business and labor sitting down together and figure out a path forward. That $3 billion, that $3 billion will make it easier for everybody to come to agreement on moving a, a path forward. Of course, I'm not going to ignore it. Pensions remain the state's biggest financial challenge. And uh, we've had a lot of history with that, but it's going to take more than 30 minutes to deal with that issue. Maybe another time, another topic. But here's an important point that people never seem to remember about pensions. Back in 2011, the General Assembly greatly reduced benefits for those hired after 2011. And so that's becoming more and more the state workforce right now. But because those benefits have been reduced, as time moves on and more workers are hired after 2011, in the long term, that will reduce the state pension costs long term. That's something that people haven't realized. I think the state hasn't done anything, but benefits have been changed for those after 2011. Maybe good or bad, depending upon your perspective, but it was an attempt to try to deal with the long term pension liability. Next slide, you see state spending per capita. And You'll see, I, I know it's kind of small, but on top you see the state of Alaska. And the state spending per capita is simply you take the size of the population of the state and divide it by how much the state spends. And so obviously uh, it adjusts for the size of the state compared to smaller states. Alaska has the highest state spending per capita. I think it's roughly $16,000. Uh, you can see the United States average is, I can't even see the numbers. I'm at the point where I need glasses, but I'm still ignoring that idea. Um, you know, it's over 6,000. Here you see Illinois. Number 37, I'll repeat that, Illinois is 37th state spending per capita. You know, you're going to hear a lot on the campaign trail the next three months that the state spending is out of control. That's the, from the, uh, a study from the, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation study. The state ranks 37th. You may not or may not believe it, but that's a study that was done. Also, I don't have a, a graphic, but... As far as number of employees per capita, uh, the state consistently ranks in the bottom 10, uh, the number of employees uh, per capita. If you've ever worked with a state agency, whatever it may be, it can be frustrating. State bureaucracies can be frustrating. Part of that is because of the staffing issues uh, the state has had over the years, especially work with IDOT, a um, number of different agencies. That's part, of the, that's part of the problem. All right, let's talk taxes, specifically the state income tax. Now, the state income tax is obviously the largest revenue source for the state. And probably for most people, their biggest financial burden is what you pay in the state income tax. This compares the highest individual income tax rates in each Midwestern state for this past year. 
you see Illinois is at 4.95%. Here's a fact, and I know many of you might, may not believe it, but the state income tax rate is actually lower now than when I first took office in 2013. Let me repeat that. The state income tax right now is lower than when I first took office in 2013. You're thinking, how can that be? I'll give you a little back history. Um, remember I mentioned the, the state meltdown in 2017? Well, the, the big issue then was that the former governor, I was willing to, um, in 2017, the temporary income tax the state enacted back in 2011, it raised the state income tax rate from 3% to 5%. Uh, that expired and the ta state tax rate went down to 3.75%. It was a 25% cut in income taxes that everybody saw. That expired in 2015. So the big controversy was the governor was willing to restore the income tax rate back to where it was, 5% or so, but he wanted a couple of things like uh, uh, passing policies that would hurt uh, labor unions. Of course, that's where the political divide was. You had Democrats and not Republicans they didn't want to pass those policies, but that's what the governor, former governor was asking. There was disagreement and the stalemate lasted for two years. Finally, Democrats and Republicans got together and said, all right, this is enough. We've got to pass a budget. So they restored the tax rate back to 4.95%, which wasn't quite 5% where it was before 2015, but to 4.95%. So that's why I can say it's lower now than when I first took office, slightly so, but again, this doesn't jive with people's perceptions and some of the political rhetoric that you've heard. But that's the story of the state's income tax rate right now. So I wanna compare our state to other states, our neighbors to the north. Their highest income tax rate, of course, Illinois has a flat tax, right? So in other words, the more money you make, the, the income rate doesn't go up. Businesses like that, the state uh, chamber of commerce loves it. If it's important to them, they think that keeps our state competitive with other states to have a flat income tax rate. So Wisconsin doesn't. So for the majority of the earners, especially the high earners, businesses, they're paying 7.65%. I love it. I'm born and raised in Wisconsin. So I, people will often come to me, you know what, and then they're frustrated for whatever reason. So I'm moving to Wisconsin to enjoy lower state taxes. I don't know what tax you're talking about, but if you're talking about the state income tax, they're paying much more. But again, people's perceptions are much different. Um, Minnesota, 9.85%. Iowa was at 8.53%. Uh, I think they just recently lowered it, the past legislative session, to somewhere where Illinois is. Um, but here's the thing about Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. You can see the rates there. Uh, similar to Illinois, or slightly lower. Indiana's at 3.23%. You need to make sure you're comparing apples and apples. They have, many counties have a county income tax on top of the state income tax. So most counties have a one to 2% county income tax. So you combine the two, it's close to where Illinois is. Again, Illinois fortunately does not have local income taxes. Same with Iowa, Michigan, Ohio. They have some uh, counties and some cities have local income taxes. Again, Illinois does not fortunately have local income taxes. In fact, Iowa and Ohio have um, local income taxes for school districts, not just property taxes. Again, fortunately, Illinois does not have local property taxes. But when you compare that and take in the additional information, that gives you an idea as far as how we compare it to other states. One more thing. Illinois, fortunately, does not have a retirement tax. Most states do. Now one area, unfortunately, which I think we agree on that Illinois does not do well in the tax rankings is the property tax, right? But let me ask you a question. How much money does a state get in property taxes? And you want to venture? How much, how much state, how much does the state get in property taxes? Zero. The state gets no money in local property taxes. These are local government decisions. Local governments set the tax rate. So when you talk about property taxes, um, you have to make sure that you know, we're talking about who's impacted here. 
and your property tax bill. Where does most of the property tax bill revenue go to? Schools. 60 to 70 percent, depending on the jurisdiction, 60 to 70 percent of your property tax bill is for schools. So my point of bringing that up is, is that you hear a lot of different proposals and political rhetoric about, let's do something about property taxes. That's good. It's a problem in Illinois. But at the end of the day, you're going to be impacting how you pay and fund K through 12 education. And you need to keep that in mind when you hear the different proposals when people talk about how we're going to deal with the property tax issue. Here you see a slide um, that indicates how different states pay for education. So the question is, why are property taxes higher in the state of Illinois compared to a lot of different states? Illinois consistently ranks in the top five or top 10. What you see is a uh, chart for K through 12 education funding. And you see the different states and you see the revenue sources for K through 12 schools. Illinois gets 40% of K through 12 schools is funded by the state. It used to be about 25% a couple years ago. The state has increased funding over the past couple years. Uh, so it's jumped up to, to 40%. But still, as you can see, 53% uh, of K through 12 funding comes from local property taxes. Now compare that to other states. Indiana, 61% of funding comes from the state. Um, only 30% comes from local. Uh, again, Kansas and Michigan have much higher percentages that K-12 funding comes from the state uh, versus local. Uh, you see Iowa and Ohio are similar to Illinois, but again, they have a local income tax that funds uh, property taxes. So how do school districts make up the difference? This is a major reason property tax dollars are higher in the state. Schools have used property tax dollars to make up the difference. Not good policy necessarily, but that's how we have chosen to fund K through 12 education. All right, but we have made progress in this community. Uh, several years ago, we changed the state's school funding formula. And I know this is kind of complicated, so bear with me, but what I'm about to tell you is what, how we changed the school funding formula has helped relieve the property tax burden here in uh, the Rockford area. We shifted funding from suburban areas, which have higher property taxes and more wealth, and therefore more dollars for local education, to districts in this area, like Rockford, Harlem, Belvedere. These districts traditionally had lower property values and higher tax rates. When you have lower property values, this district still wants to collect the same amount of money, so what do you do when you have low property values? You have to increase tax rate. It's confusing, but that's basically how the property tax system. So traditionally, the state, uh, has been unfair. So by shifting to districts like Rockford and Harlem and Belvedere, which have low property bases and more low income students, uh, we're making the, we made the system more fair. We changed this about five years ago. Uh, inherently just make it more equitable. And so what this has done, this has allowed more dollars to come to the local school districts. Um, Harlem has received more money. Uh, Rockford has received tens of millions of dollars in additional aid. And that does a couple things. It allows school districts to make, to make sure they have the resources that they need and allows them to hold the line on the property tax rate. Now remember, if you're a homeowner and your assessment goes up, even though your property tax rate goes down, your bill may still be larger that year. That's what's confusing people. But property tax rates uh, have been going down in this area. I don't have specific numbers for the Harlem School District, but uh, they would agree that they've received additional dollars and that money has helped them hold the line on their property tax rate. I do have numbers for the Rockford School District property tax rate. And you see, uh, last year, the, for last year, the property tax rate was $6.26 per $100 assessed valuation. That's how they determine your property tax bill. That's down from a couple years ago of $7.93. That's a 21% drop in the Rockford property tax rate. And again, uh, you see a quote from the Rockford School Superintendent, and he confirms that the school district can hold the line in large part uh, to the state of Illinois, the evidence-based funding formula, that's the change I was mentioning, uh, to determine state allocations of school districts as help drive additional dollars to Illinois' neediest communities, such as Rockford. And I'm sure the Rockford School Board members want to take credit as well for good financial stewardship and other decisions they made, 
But that's acknowledgement from the Rockford School Superintendent, and I've had conversations with home school officials as well, that that helps them hold the line. And in fact, when it comes to the Rockford School District, that has lowered the property tax rate. Again, if we're gonna talk about making us more competitive and we identified property tax dollars as you know, the rate is a problem, how we fund K-12 education has to be part of that conversation, and it's how we've been making a difference the past couple of years here in the Rockford area. All right, let me talk about another, uh, what I would consider a false uh, talking point, that Illinois is hemorrhaging population. This is a graph of the uh, state's population. Uh, as you can see, it pretty much uh, continuously upward. Um, to be fair, Illinois' growth compared to states in the South and the Midwest doesn't compare. For a long time, this, the state, uh, the nation's population growth has been in the, in the South and the, and the Western states. So their graphics are gonna look much more oppressive, uh, much more straight up. Uh, but these graphs are very similar to what all states in the Northeast and Midwest are dealing with. This is part of a long-term national trend. Ever since air conditioning came around, this long-term uh, trend has been in effect. It's not been dependent upon who's in power in Illinois, who the governor is in Illinois, uh, the growth has been in the South and, and the Midwest. We certainly need to try to address that long-term issue, but again, that's what we're facing. It's not uh, dependent upon a particular party or a particular governor. Um, but as you can see, the latest update uh, from the Census Bureau revealed the following. Illinois is one of six states in the past couple of months that had to update its 2020 census. And uh, Illinois' population grew by nearly a quarter million people is now about 13 million people for the first time in Illinois history. I know that's not what you hear, and that's not what the talking point is. Um, here's what happened in the census. Um, about five or six years ago, there was an estimate. I don't know who put it out. And it estimated that Illinois had lost a quarter million population. All of a sudden, that became a talking point uh, among politicians, elected officials, and trying to push a political agenda. Illinois is hemorrhaging population, and people believed it. Um, the census came out in 2020, and it was actually only 18,000 people that Illinois supposedly lost. But again, critics allowed, that allowed critics to say Illinois is still losing population. But we knew that the census was flawed in 2020 because it did not count black and brown communities adequately. They're harder to reach. And the previous administration uh, suddenly cut the census short by, by 30 to 60 days. We didn't have time to get out to people that we wanted. So we knew it was, was flawed. And the U.S. Census Bureau earlier this year agreed that Illinois is one of six states that wasn't counted, counted accurately, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the result. Again, that goes against the narrative of what you've been, uh, what you've been hearing. Now, I'm sure many of you have a story of uh, someone you know who has left the state, may have been frustrated. Uh, you know, people come and go for many different reasons. Uh, those reasons really vary. And we're a big state, so I'm sure we have more U-Hauls leaving Illinois than maybe in Wisconsin uh, or Indiana. Uh, but it's been, in fact, a talking point. Uh, but the reality is, in other studies that show, there's called the net migration. It looks at the number of people who leave a state and, and, and come into it. Uh, net migration studies, and I, know I don't want to get into that, show that um, you know, Illinoisans are not actually more likely to leave the state than residents of any other part of the country. You may or not believe that. You may have your own belief as far as what that goes. But the numbers show otherwise. I think that's an important point when you have dialogues about policy and what we think about the state. All right, let's talk about the business climate and people's perception of the business climate. You see rankings and surveys all the time. Illinois does really poorly in some of them, uh, much better than others. It depends on the metrics and the uh, viewpoint of those who are conducting the study, obviously. So then when you see the headquarters of Boeing, Caterpillar, and Citadel Securities move to another state, of course, that's not good, that's bad press. Um, but you know, it should be mentioned that Caterpillar, for example, keeps their workforce here, and they're hiring and in large numbers. So while a, while a headquarter may move, uh, the workforce many times remains. Um, and you know, the announcements that Kellogg is coming to Illinois from Michigan, or that Google just recently now Chicago is a major tech hub in downtown Chicago. Chicago is becoming a major tech center uh, for the country. We don't hear those type of headlines, but you know, those, are the gen those are the headlines as well. Um, it doesn't generate the same attention, but here are some headlines from news sources the past couple of months. Illinois ranked third in the nation for corporate expansion and relocation projects. Chicago area, the top metro for corporate investment. Illinois has the greatest growth in small business startups of any large state. Again, that may not jive with your belief, your perceptions, but that's a counter-narrative of what you hear regarding the state's business climate. 
it's always fascinating. I talk to as many business people as possible about our business climate. And it may be one or two factors, it may be 10 factors, it may be 20 factors, depending upon your business or your industry as far as whether you stay, go, uh, whatever your decision you may make. Um, and it's dependent upon the business injuries I mentioned. You know, here in Illinois, you hear the common talking points, the complaints, regulations, uh, workers' comp, uh, often cited as uh, hindrances to uh, a climate in this area. But we have a strong workforce, transportation infrastructure, and energy costs had been a strong point. I don't want to stray too far from the topic, but if you look at your ComEd bill uh, the past couple months this summer, you'll see most households have been getting a 2030 to uh, credit uh, rebate. Um, actually, my household got a $50 rebate because I have three teenage um, college students home for the summer and they like the ACN 24 hours a day. So my bill's a little higher, so my rebate's been a little higher. But if you look at that, there's a reason for that. Remember when we passed energy legislation two years ago to save the, the bio-nuclear power plant and keep those plants operating? We wrote a provision in, into legislation that said if energy prices go up to a certain point, the subsidy, which the state was going to give uh, the operators of those nuclear power plants uh, to keep them operating, that was going to turn into rebate to customers. So what has happened the past few months? Energy prices have skyrocketed, that provision kicked into effect, and so we are now joining, instead of paying by our nuclear power plant as a state, everybody is getting uh, customer rebates. So look at your bill. My point is, when it comes to energy policy, we have been competitive as far as affordability and reliability. Our energy policies have been very competitive with other states, and that's been a selling point. I'm not sure where the chaos the past six months where we are right now, but I think even the Chamber of Commerce would admit that's been a good thing for, for the state. So bottom line, many factors are involved in a company's decision whether to come or go. And as a state, we need to focus on all the factors, not the, just not necessarily one or two, uh, to make sure that uh, we are business friendly. And you know, it's interesting, sometimes political issues do play a part. Let me give you an example. You may have seen this the past couple weeks. The CEO of drug maker Eli Lilly, one of Indiana's largest employers, he's just criticized the states over the years for educational attainment and its ability to reskill the workforce. Seems like everybody has a complaint about their business climate in their state. But here's a, what he had to say about Indiana's new law restricting reproductive choices for women. I know it's a controversial issue, but here's how his take is on that, how it would affect his business climate. Let me quote him. We are concerned that this law would hinder Lilly's and Indiana's ability to attract diverse scientific engineering and business talent from, from around the world. And we've had similar examples of decisions made here in Illinois. Again, what makes a good business climate is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. All right, last bullet point. You may see that uh, CNBC just recently did a, a survey, its own survey a couple months ago, and it's on America's top states for business in 2022. I bring this up because I think it's an example how nuanced this, this issue is. Um, Illinois is ranked number 19th, and it was good because they considered like 20 different factors when it comes to what's considered a good business climate. So we're number 19. Is it top 10? No, we need to continue working in the top 10, but we're not bottom 10, we're not bottom 20, and we're not bottom 30. So um, I, I like to think, and I think we are, and that we continue to make improvements that Illinois is competitive. One thing I personally think that doesn't get enough attention when it comes to economic development is quality of life and place. You can have good roads, you can have good tax rates, but if you're a place where people don't want to live, uh, where employers don't want to move, don't want to be, employers don't want to go, I don't think the rest makes any difference in the world. So I think quality of life is incredibly important. Of course, crime is a big topic, no doubt about that. But it should be pointed out, every state, every city is dealing with an increase in crime. And I could spend the next 30 minutes talking about the state's response and what we need to do, but again, that's for another time. I want to continue on economic development. But again, this is critically important. I think most elected officials and, and leaders in this community get this as well. Um, but data has shown studies that amenities, activities, recreation, a downtown culture, especially for younger people who want to attract younger workers, uh, that's likely as big, if not bigger, to uh, contributors to whether there's a local healthy economy. Um, the state general assembly passed a capital plan, uh, first one in a decade back in 2019, and I've tried to use that money wisely. I've secured millions of dollars to boost and create local amenities uh, that I think will improve the quality of life. And 
Sports Score 2 was mentioned. One of the first things I did was pass legislation that enabled that project to take place. It was state funding. Uh, it's a major attraction for this area. Sand Park Pool. I got a call from Jay Sandin, uh, the head of Park District, on a hot June day when it was 100 degrees. He goes, thank God we have Sand Park Pool. Because, again, the place is packed, and where are you going to go when it's that hot? Again, it's the amenities in, in a community that make it a good place to live. The Coronado Theater, BMO Harris Bank Center, and the, obviously the Ice Hogs are now uh, connected with the, uh, the, the Black Hawks. The renovation of BMO made that even, in, even more secure. The Riverview Ice House, Davis Park, uh, $3 million to make that a local gathering spot. Tinker's Swiss Cottage, Ethnic Heritage Museum, Byer Stadium, where the Peaches play. They want to put a museum there. Again, another local tourist attraction. Royal Gale Park, Burpee Museum, Discovery Center, Rockford Art Museum, Anderson Gardens, Indoor City Market, Memorial Hall, and just this week we announced $3 million for the old Times Theater in downtown Rockford. And yeah, I mean, people who've been around this community know what that was and what that could contribute to the entertainment scene and our culture in our area. Again, I think things like this are important, so I'm really trying to use those tax dollars to make us a more attractive place to live. And you notice a lot of things are in downtown Rockford. I believe you need a strong central part of the community, whether it's downtown Rockford, and it benefits the entire region. People may still want to live in Loves Park, where you don't have a property tax rate, thanks to Mayor Jury and other uh, city officials for allowing that to happen. You can live in McChesney Park, but again, downtown Rockford serving as a central hub for a gathering spot, arts and, and entertainment, I think that benefits the entire community. It goes beyond one particular region. Another one of the talking points I like to, to talk about. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it's how, how the state's funding and tax dollars are distributed. And um, it's, it's an interesting talk, talking point because it's extremely effective. People automatically believe it. And here's a talking point that people believe, that downstate Illinois, meaning outside Chicago, doesn't get its fair share of tax dollars in return. You know, there have been some lawmakers that even sponsored the bill in general assembly two years ago that would have separated Chicago and Illinois. Chicago's an easy uh, you know, target. Um, but this map shows why the reality of pitting and the dangers of pitting one region of the state against the other. This map of state funding distribution by region. The yellow is the region that we're in, the north. Purple is the central. Southwest is the Metro East area or the St. Louis area, and the South is Southern Illinois. Uh, by the way, the Southern Illinois lawmakers tend to be the most vocal about separating Chicago and Illinois, but it's ironic because let me show you why uh, they probably shouldn't be doing that. It's kind of complicated, but this is the scenario of for every region, a tax dollar that a person pays the state and what you get in return. So if you put a tax dollar in, do you get that dollar back or do you never make it up? So here's a, a map of state funding distribution by region. This is from the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Well regarded, not considered partisan anyway. Our region, for every dollar of, of taxes we put in, it, you get a dollar 24 back. You get 24 cents extra. For the central part of the state, a dollar put in a dollar 87. Uh, Metro East area, you get a dollar 42 back. Downstate, the big, biggest critics. For every dollar put in, they get $2.81 back. Why? A lot of state institutions, a lot of state employees. So we're talking about state facilities, state dollars, state programs, whatever state funding may entail. A lot of our facilities are in Southern Illinois. Prisons are, are, are one example. Cook County, if you live in Cook County, for every dollar, on average, you get 90 cents back. For the suburbs, for every dollar, they get only 53 cents back. So what you see here, that northwestern, or excuse me, northeastern Illinois is where most of the state's revenue comes from. And that goes against the narratives and nuances that you hear regarding who pays for what. We should not be pitting one state, region of the state, against the other. It's not healthy, it's not productive. All right, I'm wrapping up here. Looking ahead, I have two priorities that I'm really focused on. First, the Slantis Belvedere Assembly Plant, major employer across the region. They have short and long-term problems. The short issue right now is that, like all assembly plants across the country, they're missing uh, parts. There's been a supply chain problem. They're missing those chips that we all need in vehicles today. They've been short. And so Solantis, other plants, had to shut down assembly because they've not been available. They've been building these cars 
put him in the parking lots waiting for the chips to arrive. And so unfortunately, the Belvedere plants had to lay off people, especially earlier in part of the year. They've been somewhat stable the past three or four months, which is good news, but people will hear like, oh, Belvedere is laying off people. It's got to be because of the state of Illinois. Well, that short term, it's a short term problem. It's a chip problem that every industry, every business, and every automaker is facing right now. Um, we tried to rest at the state level. We passed legislation to, one, encourage chip makers to locate to Illinois and to improve the, uh, the assembly process. But there's also a long term issue. What's going to happen? What new product is going to come to the plant to ensure that it stays open and workers uh, will remain? And that's a little bit of a more complicated issue. Automakers, as you know, are are transitioning to electric vehicle production. So by the end of the decade, they hope to have as close as possible to 100% electric vehicle uh, vehicles on the road. With gas prices, that, that'd be a great thing. Um, what we've done in the state legislature, I was the sponsor in the Senate of legislation called the Electric Vehicles Act in Illinois. Representative Bella, who you heard from easier earlier, was the sponsor in the House. Important legislation. It provides incentives for automakers uh, to retool factories or move their factories to Illinois when it comes to electric vehicle prediction. That will be the name of the game over the decade. And we want to make sure Illinois is competitive with other states in attracting not only automakers, but supply chain. A lot of jobs come because of supply chain businesses that surround the automaker, battery makers, you name it. You can see what with the Belvedere plant and all the supply chain uh, businesses around it right now. We need to attract those as well. So again, we have to be competitive. We have to put the offer on the table. Here's why I'm optimistic. During the formation of this legislation last fall, many conversations with Solantis, they were involved, as other automakers were, in the formulation of our incentive package. I don't think they would have been as serious and helped us put that package together if they weren't serious about retooling that Belvedere plant. I remain optimistic, but obviously until you see that deal signed and that product come in, uh, it remains a, a major task. But again, it's important for this region. It employs uh, people from all over the area. So we need to make sure that the Bellevue plant uh, is operating. And it's got a lot of things going for it. It's relatively new, well located uh, along the interstates. We're next to O'Hare, one of the largest airports in the world. It's positioned perfectly to take advantage of a new product line. We'll continue working on that. The other major priority is passenger rail service. Uh, as was mentioned, I secured $275 million in the capital plan in 2019 to make it possible. I know we've been talking about it for a long time. I'm sure many of you are still skeptical. But here's what I have to say. Let me give you an update as far as where it's at and uh, what's happening with that. Here's a schedule from Illinois Department of Transportation, released last year. Uh, plan to have construction. It needs to be a track improvements uh, between... Uh, Rockland and Chicago, especially the metro stops at Big Timber and Elgin, there need to be track improvements from Elgin to, to Rockford. Uh, those will get going next year. They're estimating service could be up and running by the end of 2025, probably into 2026. It takes you know, a couple years to get this uh, process moving and the, and the work done. Other thing that's going on right now, studies are being done specifically where the train station will be located. It'll be located in downtown Rockford. They're still figuring out where exactly. And they'll also have to name an operator likely Metra or Amtrak, pros and cons to both. But hopefully by the end of the year, Department of Transportation will name an operator. I think that'll make it a little more believable for people when they see if Metra's name, for example, is the operator. They are, people are aware of Metra, the commuter service uh, already in the suburban Chicago area. I think we're gonna see more of a formulation of what that service will look like. Early indications will be under two hours. It has to be car competitive. If it's three hours of downtown, that's not gonna make a difference. But ever, all the schedules are gonna be under two hours and reasonably priced, $20, $25. I think that type of service and making sure it's frequent so people can take it whenever they need it, those are key to competitive passenger rail service and that will boost this economy. That's why we need this. This is about economic development. It's not about taking a trip into Chicago and to see the Cubs or visit Michigan Avenue for a tourist trip. This is about economic development all along the passenger rail service. We have affordable housing in this area. That's the one attraction point. People will live out here and commute in to jobs where they earn more money or a more of a, a selection of jobs in the Chicago land area. We saw with COVID, there was a big uh, transition from people moving to the suburbs and the ex-urbs like, like Rockford because they wanted less, uh, less condensed conditions. They moved where they could access public transportation to the larger city. We saw that with COVID. And that will continue to be the case with our comparably lower housing prices. Don't forget, it works the other way. 
It's hard for businesses to attract labor, especially professional engineers. I've had many business owners tell me this helps us as well as far as our workforce development. People may want to live in Chicagoland area. They can still commute out to the jobs, whether it's in the aerospace industry or whatever. If you want to be an engineer, want to live in Chicagoland, you can take a, a, a train ride to Rockford. Again, it's important for workforce development in this area. So this is about economic, economic development. And that's why I continue to push this. There are skeptics, but I truly believe this is going to happen. And as long as IDOT continues moving forward, I'm going to be happy. But um, again, this is a long process. When this was first announced, it was a three to five year timeline, which seems long, but we're still within that time frame. Also, have to remember, you know, public transit agencies are dealing with COVID. Metro is at 40% capacity right now. They may not return to close to capacity until 2024. I don't know if that's going to have a connection and when Rockford gets going, but that's the latest on that situation. Again, we're trying to boost our regional economy. Listen, I'm bullish on this area. I think our best days are ahead. I truly believe that. But I think, you know, a major challenge is the negativity and sometimes inaccurate self-talk about our community and our state. It's hard to overstate the impact of that. Over time, too many Illinoisans listen to that negative narrative, believe it, rather than the truth. And what's worse, other states can use that information against us. Remember the Bruce Rauner commercial four years ago? He had governors of all the surrounding states trashing our state. Unbelievable. That's used against us. We need to have a debate. But I don't think we should have to tear down our state with subjective or misleading uh, facts to make a point. I think it actually damages our environment, our business environment, that we hope to fix. Uh, Intersect Illinois, an economic development group that promotes Illinois, said it best in a recent editorial. Our people and our companies deserve better. Thank you, everybody.